Hello everyone and welcome to the Speculative Wildlife Research Center, where we reimagine creatures and monsters from all realms of fiction through the lens of speculative biology. Today we will be looking at Scylla, the kaiju from the 1998 movie Godzilla. While the creature itself was called Godzilla in the film, the divisive nature of the movie and its creature led to a posterior Godzilla movie claiming the 1998 Godzilla was merely a monster that the Americans mistook for Godzilla, before Toho, the company that owns Godzilla, finally decided to rebrand it as Scylla, part of a claim that the movie took the god out of Godzilla. Harsh words, to be sure, but one can see where they were coming from. Still, it was very cool to see this monster get so much love in the comments, so here goes a thank you to all who asked to see this monster, and to our patrons and channel members for supporting the channel. If you too are enjoying these videos, please consider supporting the channel by liking and subscribing or joining our Patreon, link available in the video's description. Now, without further ado, let's get started. While we have met two members of the Gojira phenomenon previously, there are many creatures whose classification as part of this phenomenon is not as clear. One of these creatures is the enormous Macrognathus Byrakis, the creature colloquially known as Scylla. This species is native to islands near French Polynesia, having evolved after a population of marine iguanas, Amblyrhynchus cristatus, migrated from the Galapagos Islands. The iguanas that got to these new islands were notably bigger than their Galapagos cousins, and this was a very necessary step towards their migration. In regular marine iguanas, it has been observed that the biggest males are capable of submerging far deeper into the water to eat. As these creatures ventured further into the open seas, a bigger size would allow them not only to swim farther, but deeper in search of food. This selection towards greater size is what led to the modern gigantism of the Scylla, turning it into a nearly 10 meters or 33 feet long sea predator, almost as long as a Tyrannosaurus rex. On land, these creatures might seem heavy and ungainly, but they are capable of moving very fast for brief periods of time. In fact, they seem to easily climb rocks and cliffs despite their weight, thanks to their amazingly strong limbs. In water, however, they move with an amazing speed and agility thanks to their laterally flattened tail. Their dorsal spines help stabilize them in water, and are also very helpful on land as they allow the enormous Scylla to heat up faster after hunting in the cold ocean water. Due to their fast swimming and sharp teeth, which they share with smaller marine iguanas, the Scylla had little trouble adapting to a hunting lifestyle. Marine iguanas are occasional predators of small arthropods, but Scyllas have adapted into an almost fully carnivorous lifestyle. Scyllas mostly hunt fish, and they are quite cunning hunters, capable of setting ambushes before swimming towards their prey at blinding speed. While swimming, their dark grey and blue skin will help them blend in the water, while helping them absorb more sunlight during the mornings, thus reducing the time they spend in lethargy after waking up. These creatures present parthenogenesis and a sexual reproductive system similar to that of many different groups of animals, such as the whiptail lizards or the gremlins. Without needing to mate, adult Scyllas will lay up to three dozens of very small eggs, which will be placed inside deep burrows the mother will dig into the soil and even rock using her hard claws. The mother will stay inside the burrow, caring for the eggs. When they are close to hatching, the mother will live sparingly in order to gather as much fish as possible, which will be left in the nest for the babies to eat. Once they finally hatch, the tiny baby seals will be basically capable of fending for themselves, eating the fish their mother gathered for them 
before leaving the nest to explore. While ready to make their way in life, the baby seals are very vulnerable to predation due to their incredibly small size compared to their mother. Because of this, the babies will hunt independently, but always near the place they were born, very close to their mother, until they are ready to fend for themselves. Even when being cared for by their enormous guardian, lots of babies will meet their end before growing, and only a relatively small fraction of the brood will reach adulthood. While the young seals will be big enough to defend themselves from predators by two years of age, it will take them over 20 years to reach sexual maturity, thus ensuring new generations don't develop too soon and deplete the available food in their environment. Unfortunately, overfeeding would turn out to be the least concern to their environment, as the area near their feeding and nesting sites was chosen in the 70s for a series of nuclear tests. Large populations of these creatures were quickly displaced, and it took from 20 to 30 years for these populations to find a new suitable habitat. In the meantime, these creatures became a grave danger for fishing vessels, as they would often deplete the fish from common fishing sites and at times even attack the boats themselves to steal their catch. Finally, the biggest populations established themselves in Australia, while some individuals went as far as Jamaica and New York, all the way to the other side of the continent in their search for food. After their landing in New York, United States citizens were quick to dub this as an example of the Godzilla phenomenon mentioned previously on the channel, where giant creatures have been reported as a result of nuclear activity. However, people from other parts of the world, especially Japan, have disputed this claim, as these creatures do not represent the destructive dangers of nuclear weapons, simply doing their best to keep on living without doing harm comparable to that of other cases. And that's it for speculative biology look into Scylla. Thanks to this one having a clear animal basis in the movie, as well as a much more naturalistic behavior, it was relatively easy to translate it into a plausible animal, but it was not without its challenges. While the creature from the movie is a mutant created by radiation, I decided it would be better to treat this version not as a mutant, but as a natural creature. After all, in the movie itself it had a very clear reproductive cycle and instincts that went along with it, and they were pretty different to those of a normal marine iguana, meaning this kaiju acted more like its own natural biological entity than as a mutated creature. Even leaving that aside, this version of Godzilla lacks the more outlandish abilities of its counterparts, like the atomic breath. I know in one scene it looks as if it's breathing fire, but the official explanation is that the cars in the scene exploded by themselves after Scylla sent them flying, so no atomic breath. With all that in mind, it is no wonder that this creature lends itself to being reimagined as a normal animal much more easily than Toho's Godzilla. Plus, it was really fun to take a look at this creature and give it a place in this channel as its own thing rather than a version of Godzilla. While it had big shoes to fill, I think once we remove the context of Godzilla and see this monster as its own separate thing, Scylla is a perfectly fine monster with a pretty cool design, which I believe would have been much more appreciated had it not been meant to be a version of Godzilla its actual qualities as a monster being allowed to shine on their own. In the end, I really like how this one turned out, and I hope you guys did as well. And remember, if there's any type of creature you'd like me to give the speculative biology treatment in the show, please sound off in the comments below. Thank you all for watching, and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center.